Hello, Robert Breaker here, and welcome back to the Cloud Church. And today's message has to be, by far, bar none, the most important message that I've ever preached in my entire ministry. And it's something that I've noticed in my time in the ministry, what, 20-some years as a preacher, I've noticed that modern Christianity today has gotten away from this subject. It's like they run from it. And of course, the subject we will be dealing with today is Jesus versus Paul. You see, a lot of people today, they say, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I say, amen, I follow Jesus too. But then you start to talk about the Apostle Paul, and they say, no, 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 we don't want him. You see, modern Christianity today either doesn't understand the Apostle Paul and why he's in the Bible, or they willfully ignore him and want nothing to do with him. Many people today who claim to be Christians are so shallow, when they read the Bible, all they read is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And maybe they'll start the book of Acts, but then they don't finish it. And so they take all their doctrine, and they base all their doctrine on Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and a couple of chapters of Acts. And because of that, their doctrine is wrong. You say, what? What? They don't, what the Bible commands, rightly divide. Let me start with that verse, and then I'll get into this message. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's a command in the Bible, which, by the way, only the King James Bible has the word study. All the other perversions take that word out and change it to something else. Why wouldn't they want you to study the Word of God? I don't understand. We're supposed to. And it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. What I want to do today is rightly divide the Word of Truth so that we be not ashamed. And I want to study the Scriptures. And what I want to do is focus in on this guy named Paul and why he's in the Bible. I get emails all the time from people that tell me, you're wrong, Mr. Breaker, because you're, you're preaching Paul. And Paul shouldn't be in the Bible. We follow Jesus. We don't follow Paul. Why do they say such a thing? Well, I understand they, they want to exalt Jesus, and that's wonderful. Because Jesus is God, as we'll see through this message. He's the Savior, as we'll see in a little bit. But why do they reject the Apostle Paul? I even had a guy one time tell me that the Apostle Paul is a liar and a deceiver, and he weaseled his way into the Bible, and he shouldn't be there. So did God inspire his holy word, but then allow a guy to put his books in that shouldn't be there? That doesn't make sense. Well, if you know, I hope you know, there are 66 books in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books. And in the New Testament, there are 27. Now watch this with me. Paul wrote 14 books. So Paul wrote 14 books in the entire Bible. 14 books out of 66 books in the entire Bible, that's 21%. Paul wrote 21% of the entire Bible. Now, if you say, you can't have Paul in the Bible, he shouldn't be there, let's throw then you're trying to take away one-fifth of my Bible and tell me not to read it. How weird. Well, if you take the New Testament, 14 books of Paul, and take 27 out of the books, that comes to 51.8. I'm going to round up, okay? 52%. 52%. Of the New Testament, 14 books out of 27, 52% of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. And now you're going to tell me, mister, I don't know who you are, you know who you are that send me those emails, that we shouldn't read Paul and that Paul shouldn't be in the Bible and he's the bad guy. <laughs> I just find that so interesting. Why? Why do you have this hatred for the Apostle Paul, that you want to just rip him out of the Bible and say he shouldn't be there. Why would we do that? We're ripping out 21% of the Bible. If we steal Paul and say, no, he's not for today, then we're taking out 52% of the New Testament and saying, no, we don't want that. That's the problem. That's the problem. And you know what? I was thinking about this earlier today. I'll go ahead and write this up here. If you have 66 books of the Bible and you take away 14 of them, guess how many you're ended up with? You ended up with 52 books. 
52 divided by 4 is 13. 13 is not a very good number for some reason. Now if you take these 27 books of the New Testament and take them out, guess what you're left with? 13. Do you know what 13 times, uh, 39 divided by uh, 3 is? 13. There's a lot of 13's in the Bible. Well, the Old Testament, because 13 is a number of a curse, you're cursed when it comes to the number 13. Well, the Bible says that the Old Testament, it, cursed are they that are under the law. Or cursed are they that continueth not in all things of the law. So I can see why the Old Testament adds up to a 13, to a number of a curse. But there's no curse in the New Testament unless you take Paul out. So maybe you're accursed if you try to steal Paul from the Bible. Now, I've got a lot of stuff that I need to teach you today. I want to leave this up here, but I'm not going to have enough room. But I think that's just interesting. Why do people want to take the Apostle Paul out of the Bible? Well, as you'll see here in a minute, the reason they want to, and the people that want to do this, they are the deceivers. They are the liars. They are the ones that are trying to uh, change the Word of God and try to take out of it what God has put in it. So what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to give you as much Bible as I can to prove to you who the Apostle Paul is and why he is in the Bible. And beyond any shadow of a doubt, we'll put to rest this argument of Paul shouldn't be in the Bible and Paul is a liar and Paul is a, is a man who just snuck in and took over Christianity and tried to pervert it. No, we're going to prove from the Word of God who Paul is, why he's in the Bible, and what he, what it's all about. Why Paul? Why is Paul in the Scriptures? So over here, we have the Law of Moses. Alright, let me just real quickly write all this up here, and then we're going to go to the Scriptures and look at the verses. Over here, during the Law of the Moses, uh, we have Jesus' ministry. So we're going to look a little bit about Jesus today. Over here you have Peter and the early apostles. And then, all of a sudden, everything changes to Paul as you go through the book of Acts. This, of course, is the church age. And I hope you know your Bible. I hope you understand dispensations. There are a lot of people today that say, well, I don't believe in dispensations. Well, you don't rightly divide the word of truth without understanding that there are different time periods. We're going to look at that today, too. I'm going to show you some verses that talk about dispensations. This is the day and age of grace, where we're saved by grace through faith without works. This, of course, would be the rapture. Then over here is the tribulation period. Then this over here is what we call the millennial kingdom, which Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. I'll abbreviate that. First man, of course, was Adam. Way after Adam was a guy named Abraham, whom God called to bring forth the Jewish nation. Now, we have the whole Bible laid out up here. Now, we're going to go through the scriptures and look at some things. And I just believe this is so important, and I hope, like I said, that this will be a blessing to you. Because almost all churches nowadays, almost all of them, have this teaching wrong. I've known people that were Methodists, and they're very strong against Paul. And they say, no, we follow Jesus, we don't follow Paul. I've known other denominations that say, no, 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 we have nothing to do with Paul or Jesus, we're under the law. <laughs> A Seventh-day Adventist, I believe they call themselves. Some of them claim to follow Jesus, but many of them reject what Jesus did on the cross and believe they can be saved by the law. So you have all these different denominations in Christianity today. Are they right? Well, it all hinges on what do they do with Paul. That determines whether or not they have their doctrine straight according to the Word of God. So go with me, and let's go ahead and look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. One thing we have to realize is that all the Bible is written for us to read. We're supposed to read the entire Bible. But not all of the Bible applies to us in this age today. You see, that Old Testament law was just that. It was the Old Testament. But the Bible says where the death of a testator is, well, that begins a New Testament. So the New Testament is all about Jesus who died on the cross and shed his blood. And it's all about coming to Jesus for salvation, and we're not saved by the law. 
We're saved by grace. So you have to see, that's the first division in the Bible, right? The dividing, the division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So here we go. Let's go to Romans chapter 15, and it's just so amazing. Chapter 15 of Romans. I don't know if you can see this that far away, but in my Bible it's so neat because on one side over here it says Jesus was this, and then right across the page right there it says now Paul was this. And so in Romans chapter 15, we see, I guess we could call it a contrast, between Paul and Jesus. And it tells us here what Jesus' ministry was all about. And over here it tells us about Paul's ministry and what it was all about. And we're going to go through and explain this to the best of my ability, hopefully, so you can see the difference between Paul and Jesus and why Paul is in the Bible. So, verse 8 Romans 15.8 says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So right off the bat, it tells us that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision. Now under the law of Moses, you had to be circumcised. Circumcision, then, was the people under the law. So Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision. To make the promises to the fathers. What were the promises to the fathers? And who are the fathers? Well, they're Jewish fathers. See, Jesus was a Jew. So all this was all about Jews. And Jesus was a Jew who came to Jews. And we're going to look at that. So there's verse 8. I'll read it again. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister. So Jesus is ministry. Of the circumcision. He, Jesus circumcised, going to the circumcision, going to Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So that was Jesus' ministry. A Jew coming to Jews, circumcision. He was to the circumcision. He was to the Jews. He was a minister of the circumcision. Now we go to verse 16. Romans 15, 16 tells us the contrast. Jesus was to the circumcision, Paul, over here, was to whom? Verse 16, Paul says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul is saying, I was more to the Gentiles. And his ministry was more. Now, I'm not going to say only, because there are some people out there that are preach, Peter only went to Jews and Paul only went to Gentiles. That's bunk. That's a lie. Peter went to Jews, but he also went to Cornelius, a Gentile. Paul was a, a missionary to Gentiles, but at times he would go first to anywhere he went. The first place he'd go was to the tabernacle because he loved his nation of Israel and wanted to see them saved too. So you can't say Peter only to Jews and Paul only to Gentiles. No, they went to both. But, as we'll see in a minute, Peter was more to Jews and Paul was more to Gentiles. It'd be like today calling someone a missionary. And so and so would say, Well, I'm a missionary to to France. Okay. Well that doesn't mean he can't in America win people to the Lord here, right? So he might be going to a certain group or certain people, but just because that was his uh, office, if you will, of a missionary to a certain people, didn't mean there was other people he couldn't preach the gospel to as well. So we would call today, if they lived today, Peter was a missionary to Jews and Paul was a missionary to Gentiles. But, he preached to Gentiles a couple times. He preached to Jews as well. So it's important to understand. So, according to chapter 15 of Romans, verse 16, Paul is very dogmatic. He tells us that he was the minister of Jesus to the Gentiles. So, Paul's ministry was to minister to Gentiles. What was he ministering? We're going to see in a minute. He was preaching the gospel. That's what his job was. That's what his reason for being was. That's why he's in the Bible. So we have Jesus, a Jew, going to Jews. We have Paul, a Jew, being called by God to be a minister to the Gentiles. But Paul was also to the Jews. But very seldom in the ministry of Jesus does he ever go to a Gentile. There was one time when a Gentile woman comes to Jesus and he called her a dog. He said, it's not meat to throw crumbs under the table to the dogs. And she says, yea, Lord, but uh, you know, even the dogs lick the crumbs. 
And Jesus said, all right, all right, she's healed, go away. And God healed the daughter of that woman. But there was a reason. Why didn't Jesus come to Gentiles in his ministry? Why was that? We'll get to that in a minute. So let's look first at Jesus, then let's look at Paul. And let's understand, if we can, why Paul is in the Bible. Like I told you earlier, there's so many people today that are turning against Paul. And it's so odd, because the early church, 100 years after Jesus, 200 years after Jesus, the early church, the true Christians, guess what they called themselves? Paulicians, followers of Paul. Why would there, was there a time? Well, then you had a church that grew called the Catholic Church, and they said, no, we reject Paul. We want Peter. Well, you get a chance, you can go to the Cloud Church and look up um, under the Why I'm Not series, Why I'm Not a Roman Catholic. Because in the Bible, Peter was not a pope. Peter was married. He makes an awful pope. But you see, every religious cult in the world today that claims to be Christians are a cult because they forget Paul. And they try to go to someone else instead of Paul. Now, we don't follow Paul as our Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Paul only points to Jesus for salvation. But you can't start a church and leave Paul out. You can't run a church and try to get people saved and leave out Paul. He's in the Bible for a reason. And we're going to find out what that reason is. So let's begin with Jesus. Let's look at what the Bible says about Jesus, who he was, what his ministry was, who he came to, and the reason that Jesus came. And then we'll look at Paul and the reason that Paul is in the Bible. So go with me to John chapter 1. Well, actually, I'll just read John chapter 1 while you're looking for Matthew 15. So look up Matthew 15. But John chapter 1 and verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, okay? But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law was given by Moses, and the law was up until Jesus. So the law was given by Moses, and all these people were under the law, but Jesus came and started his ministry to fulfill certain promises made to the fathers. So the law and the prophets were until the ministry of Jesus. And then Jesus fulfilled the law. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. So in John chapter, or Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, Jesus Christ says these words, okay? If you have a Bible with red lettering, it should be in red lettering. Because these are Jesus' words, okay? You want to believe the Bible? You want to believe Jesus? What did Jesus say about himself? And who, whom, to whom did Jesus say that he came in his ministry? In Matthew 15, 24, it says, But he answered and said, this is Jesus, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus came down from heaven to Israel. Only to Israel did Jesus come. He says, I'm only come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That means that when Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry, he did not come to Gentiles. I mean, it can't be any more plain. Jesus said it from his own lips, that Jesus came as a Jew to Jews. John chapter 4 and verse 22. This is such an important message, and you'll see why as we go along. Jesus says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So here Jesus says he came to the Jews, and Jesus says that salvation is of the Jews. Why is that? Why is salvation of the Jews? Well, if you remember back here with Abraham, God called out Abraham and made a mighty nation. And he called Israel. And uh, back there, I believe it's in Exodus, God says, Israel's my firstborn. And God says of Israel, they're my chosen people. They're a royal priesthood, a chosen nation. So this was God's people. And if you wanted to be saved in the Old Testament, you had to come under that law. And if you were a Gentile back then, you had to become a convert to Judaism because salvation was of the Jews. God chose the way of salvation was to come to the law of Moses. Now the law of Moses, did it save you? Actually, the Bible says that the law of Moses was nothing but um, a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was a law to show us the knowledge of sin. So what the law did, it showed you you were a sinner. And according to the law, the way to have that sin remitted or taken away or forgiven 
was through a sacrifice of blood. And that sacrifice of blood was a lamb or a goat or a bullock, what the law demanded, an animal sacrifice forgave sins. Now when Jesus Christ came, he said, no more do you have to do those animal sacrifices. The Bible says, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb, came and died in our place as our sacrifice. Thank God for that. But when he did his ministry, it was for Jews, and all that was for the Jewish nation. And so all this is all Jews, all for the Jews. John chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us clearly, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Who is His own? The Jews. Jesus Christ was a Jew, born as a Jew. He came to His own, to the Jews. Let's go to Acts chapter 13. And here we hear it again. Who did Jesus Christ come for? What did He come for? Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. And it says, And when He had removed Him, He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now in Romans 15 it says that Jesus came to fulfill the promise to the fathers. And here we're reading that there was a promise made, and that Jesus came to fulfill it. So who did he come to? He came to the Jews. 24, when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So Jesus, a Jew, came to the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus came to save the Jews. Now something happened, and I can't wait to get there, after in which the Jewish nation as a whole rejected their Messiah. And when they did, it changed. The salvation of the Jews changed to where Gentiles could be saved. And that's where Paul comes in, the minister to the Gentiles. And we'll get to that, we'll get to that. I can't wait to get to that, but let me just read some more here. In Acts chapter 13, and I'll just continue there in verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired that Pilate that he should be slain. So this is Jesus. The religious leaders offered up Jesus to be killed. Verse 29, When they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Well, all that was written of him. There was a lot of Old Testament books that prophesied that Jesus was going to die and that all these things would happen. And guess what? Everything happened that was prophesied of Jesus within a 24-hour period of when he was going to be crucified, proving that the Bible is true. And it says here in verse 29, When they had filled all that was written, written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. 31, And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And 32 says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he raised up Jesus again. So there keeps going back to the promise of the fathers, the promise of the fathers. The promise. Jesus' ministry was to fulfill promises made to the fathers. What were the promises made? That there would come a Messiah, and Jesus was him. And that he would die. But many people in the Old Testament didn't realize that his coming was to die for their sins. They thought he would come to sit on the throne of his father, David, which we'll get to in a minute as well. Uh, let's go ahead to verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to a corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known therefore unto you, men and brethren, I read that backwards, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, now watch this, verse 39, and by him, Jesus, 
all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. So Jesus' ministry was to come and to tell these people, look, the promises I made, I'm going to fulfill them here. And I'm here to bring you salvation. And then he died. And he rose again. We just read and now they said, no, you can't be justified by the law. The law no longer saves. We are justified by Him, by Jesus. But who is it written to? Men and brethren, men and brethren, verse 26, children of the stock of Abraham. Notice he's speaking to Jews. <laughs> the ministry of Jesus was to Jews. And when he died and rose again, that ministry came out here to Peter and the early apostles who continued to take that message to Jews until there was a point in which the Jews as a nation as a whole rejected their Messiah and then God took it to the Gentiles. And thank God He did, because I'm a dirty, rotten Gentile. Well, I'm saved now, so I'm no longer a Gentile. I'm part of the church of God. So Jesus came as a Jew to the Jews. What for? Well, here's what Jesus came preaching, and this is what so many in churches today don't understand. I've talked to people that have sit in church 40, 50, 60 years, and they have never, not once, heard what I'm about to show you from the Bible today. Why is that? Because many churches today don't study the Bible, don't read the Bible, and they don't understand, hey, it's all about the Apostle Paul that points us to Jesus. You see, they want to come to Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, rather than coming to Jesus through this side. Now, why is that important? We'll get to that in a minute. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 32. Matthew 4, 23. Excuse me, I'm a little lisdexic, if you will. <laughs> it says in verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching, watch what he preached, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus came, and in his ministry, what did he preach? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Now notice that's not this gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus came preaching the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. What was he talking about? Well, over here there's a kingdom. I'm in the way here. There's a kingdom. And in that kingdom is when literally there will be a throne of David that Jesus Christ will sit in that throne. He will literally sit on that throne and rule and reign on the house, uh, over the house of David, over all the Jewish nation, in that throne. And see, I'm not a good artist, so I'm already messing it up. But that's supposed to be a throne. All right? And Jesus will be seating, sitting in that throne and ruling and reigning for a thousand years. There were many prophecies of that in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, someone said that 90% of the prophets in the Old Testament all speak of that coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. So 90% of the major and minor, minor prophets are all prophecies of this. Only about 10% do they prophesy of this. Now, if you get a chance, go to cloudchurch.org. Look up past sermons. I've got a sermon about the two comings of Jesus Christ. That will show you more about how Jesus came twice, or will have come twice. Because he came the first time to die. He came as a lamb. To be a sacrifice. But he comes again at Armageddon. And when he comes again, he's going to come to rule. And he's going to come as a lion. He's going to come in battle array. And he's going to sit himself on the throne with a rod of iron. So those Jews, when they saw Jesus come and he came preaching the kingdom... They thought that that kingdom here was going to start there. So they said, oh, he's going to come in, he's going to kick out Pilate, he's going to kick out Herod, he's going to defeat the Roman Empire, and he's going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years right there. But what happened? Now some people call this the postponement theory. And they say that, that the theory is that uh, this kingdom was postponed because of this. Well, I call it the postponement fact, as we'll see from the Bible. It's not a theory, it's a fact. There was a kingdom that could have started right there, but we clearly see the rejection of the Messiah by the Jewish people. And because of that, and Jesus was preaching this kingdom, it could have been this was right here. But because of the rejection by the Jewish people of their Messiah, 
God said, I've got to postpone this. And that's the reason why God called Paul. So that we, Gentiles, could be saved. That's why we have the church age. Some people call it a parenthetical age. It's one of those things that could have happened or could not have happened because everything was based upon what the Jews did with their Messiah. And what did they do? They yelled, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, and they killed the Lord of glory. See, Jesus Christ is the Savior. And we're going to look at that. Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Jesus Christ is God. And yet the Jews said, we will not have this man to rule over us. So God said, okay, my kingdom, I'm just going to put way out here. And I'm going to let you Jewish people go through so much suffering. And the history after Jesus of the Jewish people is a history of a nation of people that have suffered and suffered and suffered for almost 2,000 years. Until about 1948 when they started to go back into their land. And even now they're suffering as people around their land want to get rid of them. Let me give you another example. Matthew chapter 9, and verse 35. Jesus is coming and it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So Jesus, when he came in his earthly ministry, what was he doing? He was preaching this right here. And yet so few people that claim to be Christians even realize that when they read through the Bible. And so we clearly see Jesus, when he came to these Jews, he was preaching to them a gospel. What's the word gospel mean? It means good news. And the good news that Jesus was preaching them was he says, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is at hand. What does it mean to be at hand? It means it can be right there. It's about to start. But guess what? It's based upon what you do with Jesus. And they rejected their Messiah, they crucified, they killed him. So God says, okay, now it's way out here. That's the postponement fact. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 32, we read that Jesus, when he came, he came for a purpose. You see, he came preaching the kingdom because the kingdom could have been set up right then. Luke chapter 1 and verse 32, speaking of Jesus Christ, and it says, And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, are we under the kingdom of God right now? Well, there's a spiritual kingdom that's taking place now in the, in the church age called the kingdom of God. But the literal kingdom of heaven, that kingdom in which God, Jesus Christ, comes and sits on that throne of David in Jerusalem, has not come yet. That's a future coming kingdom, and that's a kingdom that will take place when Jesus returns at Armageddon. So it's not just a postponement theory. It's a postponement fact that, that when Jesus came, he came preaching this kingdom. It's at hand. It can come if you'll accept me. But the Jews as a nation rejected their Messiah. So God said, okay, now this is going to be out here, and now this is going to take place first. And that's where we see the entrance of Paul and why Paul is in the Bible. So we have Jesus in the Bible. <clears throat> and Jesus came to Jews preaching the message of the kingdom. That's the message of the Millennial Kingdom. We, uh, there's so many churches today that like to hang around Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They like to preach what they call the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are this. Blessed are that. And they love to preach the words of Jesus. And then they try to apply them to us today. When they're not. They're out there. Because Jesus, when he was preaching, he was preaching, here's what's going to happen when I'm in my kingdom. So, as we look at it today, and the kingdom's been postponed, almost all that Jesus was preaching in his ministry applies to that right there. And it hasn't happened yet. Not yet. So it's so important to see that, and yet, so few people that claim to be Christians preach that today. So, there's just so much to go into, but look at John chapter 8. Let's just look quickly at who Jesus was, and then we'll look at Paul. John chapter 8 and verse 23 says, And he saith unto him, unto them, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. 
Now, if you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, look up past sermons, and look up the sermon I preached entitled The Difference Between the Who and the What of Salvation. Hopefully, if you don't understand this message, that will explain it. Because when Jesus came in his ministry, all the emphasis was, I am a Jew, and you are all Jews. And I am preaching to Jews, and you have to believe who I am. So Jesus, as he's going around preaching the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, he's saying, who do you believe that I am? Who do you believe that I am? And for the Jews to come to Jesus, they had to believe who he was. Well, who did they have to believe he was? They had to believe he was their Messiah. So the message that Jesus was pushing, the message that Jesus was preaching in his ministry, is not the same message that we're saved by today. And we're going to see that from Paul's writings. So just believing that Jesus is the Messiah doesn't save you. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible in which there were some demon-possessed guys. And they came over and they fell down on their knees and they said, Jesus, are you here to cast us out before our time? And they said, we know who you are. And Jesus said, don't tell anyone. He said, go out. And he cast them into a bunch of swine. And guess what? They said, we know who you are. Well, were those demons saved because they knew Jesus was the Messiah? No. Are we saved today because we know Jesus is the Messiah? No. But all the emphasis of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus, a Jew, was preaching to Jews, was trust who Jesus is. Trust that he is your Messiah because your Messiah has come. And had the entire nation of Israel trusted their Messiah, that kingdom would have started right then. But they rejected him. And we're going to look at that rejection as well. Three different times the leaders of Israel rejected their Messiah. So who is Jesus? Well, he's the Messiah. He is the Savior. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, it tells us who Jesus is. I've got a message on, on the, the cloudchurch.org under past sermons. It's called, Who is Jesus? It's a simple message. I'm surprised how many views it's gotten. A lot of people have watched it said it's been a blessing to you. If you get a chance, go watch that. Who is Jesus? And it shows you who Jesus is. But in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, it tells us, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is the Lord. And He is Christ. What does the word Christ mean? It means the Anointed One. Well, that's what Mashiach, or Messiah, means. It's the Anointed One. So Jesus Christ, God, came down from heaven, born of a virgin, and he was the Messiah. Let me show you 1 Timothy 3.16 and then we'll move on. But it's so important. You see, people will try to tell you that when you preach Paul, you're trying to downgrade Jesus. There are people that actually say, Oh, you're evil because you preach the Apostle Paul, and so you try to put Jesus down. No, a thousand times no. When you rightly divide the scriptures and learn what the Bible teaches and see why Paul's in the Bible... It does nothing but glorify and magnify who Jesus is. You see, uh, being a follower of Paul does in no way puts down Jesus. To the contrary, it puts Jesus in his proper perspective. Because Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. So manifest, excuse me. God was manifest in the flesh. So Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. So we must always remember who Jesus is. Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. But when He came, He came only to the Jews. He preached to them about the kingdom. And He told them, salvation is for you. Now you must trust who I am. And guess what they did? They said, we want you not crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, his blood be upon us, they cried. And God said, okay, all right, if you guys don't want this salvation that I offer, I'm going to take it to the Gentiles. Boy, I'm getting goosebumps, because thank God, <laughs> thank God that salvation's coming to the Gentiles. Now let me just depart for a second and say this, God is not done with Israel as a nation. Once this rapture takes place, and all the church is taken out, then the Bible teaches us that God will go back to dealing with Israel just like He did back here. And that all the nation of Israel, God's going to save that nation, although it's going to be a remnant. Some of them will reject them again and take the mark of the beast, but there will be a remnant of Jews, of the nation, that will turn to Jesus. And they're the ones that will go through the tribulation into this kingdom 
when Jesus returns. So God's not done with the Jews. I had somebody say one time, well, you hate the Jews and, and you, you believe in replacement theology. No, I don't. I don't believe the church replaced Israel. I believe the church is God's chosen people in this day and age, but that there still is Israel. And that someday they will come to their Messiah. That's what the Bible teaches. You see, people that believe in a replacement theory say, nope, there'll never be Israel ever again. Well, that's stupid because the promises made to the fathers was that Jesus will sit on his throne in David. Well, if there won't be any Israel anymore, then how is Jesus going to sit on the throne of David if there's no Jerusalem for him to rule in? So, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, the Jews will come back as a nation. But right now, we're in a time called the church age, in which salvation is a little different. Okay, so, so Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Savior. He came as a Jew to Jews in order to sit on his throne in Jerusalem. But what happened? Well, what happened was the nation, the religious leaders said, we don't want you. And so there was a postponement that took place. And now the kingdom, rather than starting here, will start out here, way in the future. Now because of that, we find the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a transitional book, but it's also a pivotal book. It's an important book. It's a book that so few people read and understand. And because they don't read it, they don't put Paul where he belongs. They don't understand Paul. But the book of Acts shows us the change from Jesus and Jesus' ministry and Peter and Peter's ministry to Paul's ministry. Why it changed, how it changed, what happened. So now let's look at Paul. But as we do, let's first look at uh, the book of Acts, okay? Acts chapter 1. I'll just show you a little bit of the changes. And if you get a chance, read through the book of Acts. It's a fun book. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a hard book. There's so many different things going on that you can't really base your doctrine on the book of Acts because there's changes taking place throughout the entire book. And what happens is at the end of the book of Acts, all doctrine gets settled with Paul. So Paul becomes the main minister. And no more are we under Jesus' ministry. No more are we under Peter and the Apostles' ministry. Now, today, in the church age, according to the Bible, we're all under Paul's ministry, and we're all under Paul's writings, which are Romans through Philemon. And so all the doctrine of the church age today comes from these books of Paul. Now, I believe Hebrews was written way over here. You get a ch chance, go to the Cloud Church, and you can look up... Uh, I mean, instead of being under past sermons, I believe it's under Bible studies about when was Hebrews written. And I believe that's a good Bible study. I do believe that Paul wrote Hebrews, but I do believe he wrote it back here when God was still dealing with the Jews rather than today. And that's a fun study. Okay, so what happened? Is Jesus here now? No. Where is Jesus? Well, we're told in the Bible that he's, that he's up in heaven. Now in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 through 10... Jesus rises again from the dead, and here's what he tells his disciples. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but she shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Right, you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, look up past sermons, and look at the one called Baptism. And we see a difference between water baptism and spirit baptism. We're not saved by water baptism today. This is something that changed in the book of Acts. Today we're saved by faith. And the moment we believe, we're instantly baptized with the Holy Spirit, according to the Scriptures. Like I said, a lot of people, they don't read the entire book of Acts. They don't read the epistles of Paul, so they don't see that. Uh, verse uh, 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now why would Jesus say you should not know the times or the seasons? Because it could still come, this kingdom if they preached to Jews and the Jews accepted their Messiah. But unfortunately, once again, the Jews rejected their Messiah. As a matter of fact, there's three times in the Bible in, the, in which the Jewish nation rejects their Messiah. The first was the preaching of John. When John the Baptist came, he was preaching, and he says, I came to make manifest to Israel Jesus, the Messiah. And so he's baptizing, and the Bible says the Pharisees came, and they looked and they go, we're not going to take that. That was the first rejection by the religious leaders 
the rejection of God the Father because God the Father sent John the Baptist. The second time was when they rejected Jesus Christ. That's when the religious leaders of Israel rejected God the Son, Jesus. And now we go to Acts chapter 7, and here's the final chance that God gives to Israel. He gives them one more chance, and he says, Now, will you accept me? And look at what it says in verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised hearts and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So there's a man named Stephen who stands up and preaches to the Sanhedrin. He stands up and preaches to these Jews. And they reject God, the Holy Spirit. So they reject God the Father through the preaching of John. They reject God the Son, Jesus, through his preaching of his kingdom coming. And that he was the Messiah. And then the final time, Acts chapter 7, they reject God, the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, in baseball they say, strike three, you're out. God was merciful to give Israel three chances to accept their Messiah and take him and trust him. And had they trusted who he was and accepted him, that kingdom would have been way back here. But watch what happens in this passage in Acts chapter 7. Verse 55, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Twice we are told that this guy Stephen was over there preaching. And twice Stephen says he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now in other passages of the scripture, we're told that Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father in heaven. So why would Jesus Christ be standing right here in Acts chapter 7? I know why. Because that was it. That was the last opportunity. It was either strike three, or they got a home run because they accepted their Messiah. And so Jesus stood up and was standing, ready to come back for this kingdom to start. And then what happened? Well, the rest of the verse here, verse 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They stoned Stephen. The ultimate rejection. Three rejections of the Messiah. And God sat back down. And so God says, okay, now it's time to change to the Gentiles. Because the Jews, salvation is the Jews, they reject it. So now I'll take it to the Gentiles. And that's what God did. And as you go through the book of Acts, you find some exciting stuff. All you have to do is read it. That's Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch. Who would that be? A Gentile. Get saved. Acts chapter 9, who gets saved? Paul! Acts chapter 10 and, verse, and, and Acts chapter 11, we have old Peter again shows up. And Peter gets a guy named Cornelius saved, a Gentile. See how it's turning and turning and turning more and more from Jews to Gentiles? Over in chapter 13, we have the sending out of Paul as a minister, as a missionary. Acts chapter 15, we have... The, the early church meeting together after Paul goes out and preaches. And they all get together and they all say, verse 11, We believe that through grace, through faith, we shall be saved, even as they. Because they're telling about how Gentiles got saved by faith. I love verse 15. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. See, there's no water baptism to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 15.11 says you're saved by grace. Why, Jesus came, and grace and truth came by Jesus. And then, as the book of Acts changes from Jews to Gentiles, it's all about, oops, it's all about faith. It's all about believing. It's all saved by grace. And then it all begins to be the ministry of Paul, the ministry of grace. So, let's look at some more things here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. And this is so important because what God did is because the Jews rejected him, because the Jewish nation as a whole, and not all Jews rejected him, there were some Jewish converts to following Jesus. But the nation, the religious leaders as a whole, the nation rejected their Messiah. And when they did, the final time, Acts 7, God said, okay now, I'm going to get this guy named Paul, I'm going to call him to go take the gospel. But guess what he said? God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reveal unto him the gospel. And today, we are not saved by trusting who Jesus is. We're saved by trusting what Jesus did. 
As I stated earlier, go to the Cloud Church, look up that message, the difference between the who and the what of salvation. Because what we find as we continue in in the Bible studying, as we rightly divide the word of truth, is that God called this guy Paul out, and God revealed something to him. What did God reveal to him? Well, let's look over here in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So according to the Bible, God revealed to Paul what? The gospel for us today. Now, if God waited to reveal the gospel to Paul... Why did he wait? Because it had to cut off from the Jews. So all the way up over here till Paul, till God revealed the gospel to Paul, all that is still old to the Jews. Even though that starts the New Testament, it's still going to the Jews and they have a chance to be saved. All to the Jews here. And then through Paul, we, goss, we Gentiles get a chance to be saved. So what you have is you have a change. Jesus, a Jew, two Jews calls out some Jews and tells those Jews, go preach to the Jews and tell them to trust me as their Savior. And up until Acts chapter 7, they have a chance. But then they stone Stephen and God says, that's it. That's, it's done. You Jews have rejected me for the final time. I am now going to give the gospel to Paul to take to the lost and dying Gentile world. Now a Jew can still be saved today, but they must come through this gospel. And anyone today who wants to be saved must come through this gospel that God revealed to Paul. And I'm going to finish this message by showing you those verses. Do you see now why Paul is so important, though? You see, we don't live back here in the ministry of Jesus. And we don't live here in the early ministry of the early apostles. We live on this side, so we live after Paul. So if we want to come to Jesus today, we can't come through this or this. The way to come to Jesus is through the gospel. What is the gospel? It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and I'm going to hold that off to the very end, and we'll read that. But I want you to look at these things. Paul says that he, he was revealed unto him, um, he, well, verse 12, was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What was taught to Paul? The gospel. So who revealed the gospel to Paul? Actually, it was Jesus. Jesus revealed to Paul the gospel. If you take Paul out of the Bible, you're cutting your own throat. Because Jesus in heaven says, All right, I'm changing now from Jews to Gentiles, and Paul, you're going to be one to take the gospel message. Jesus. So if you want to come to Jesus today for salvation, because he's the Savior, you can't come to Jesus today unless you come through the gospel that Jesus revealed to Paul. That's so simple, but it's the truth. So many verses. Let's go to... Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. But contrary wise, when, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Jesus Christ, uh, so Paul went to the Gentiles, and he's saying that Paul, uh, Peter went more to the Jews. Uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. Oh, this is such an important message. If you leave Paul out, you're in trouble. You're leaving out the gospel of salvation. Because Jesus gave it to Paul and revealed unto him, this is what you preach so the Gentiles can be saved. And if you want to leave that out, you're leaving out the way to Jesus. Because we only come to Jesus today through this gospel. Romans chapter 11, verse 13, Paul tells us, he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch that I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul is our apostle today. Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. Look at what the apostle Paul says in Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now watch this. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. What is the mystery? 
It was a mystery that God kept secret before the world began. But then Paul says, my gospel and the revelation of my gospel. Paul calls the gospel that God revealed unto him, my gospel. And guess what? It's the only way to be saved today. It's through the gospel of Paul. More and more and more. There's so many more verses. Well, let me go ahead and read the next verse here. I hate to forget it. Verse 26, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. How is that gospel now made manifest? Because God revealed it to Paul. Then Paul took it to the early apostles and said, This is what God revealed to me to preach for salvation. And they said, Okay. Acts 15.11, we believe that by grace through faith we shall be saved, even as they. The gospel today is called the gospel of the grace of God. Salvation by trusting in what Jesus did for us. His death, burial, and resurrection. It's what he did for us in our place. Go to Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. This is how important Paul is. And if you still want to take Paul out of the Bible, then I have one thing to say for you. See you at the judgment. That's all I can say. If you choose to reject Paul in the gospel God, Jesus gave to him for salvation, you will be judged someday. And look at what Paul says in Romans 2.16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The Apostle Paul tells us plainly that one day God, Jesus, will judge all men. And Jesus will judge how? According to what Paul calls my gospel. So someday, everybody that's ever lived after Paul will stand before God and give account of himself. And according to the authority of the word of God, Jesus Christ himself is going to say, All right, I told Paul the gospel of salvation. What would you do with it? So in essence, Jesus will be saying, What would you do with Paul? What would you do with what I told you uh, through Paul? What would you do with, with Paul's gospel? You see, I called Paul for a purpose to give you the way of salvation. What would you do with it? Oh, well, God, I, I didn't think Paul should be in the Bible, so I ripped him out. Go to hell, is what God, Jesus Christ will say. Because you didn't study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth. You chose to just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and maybe a little bit of Acts, but you didn't keep reading all the way through to see that it all changed, and that God said, okay, now, Paul, you come over here, I have a work for you, here's the gospel of today, here's salvation, take that to the world. You know what the Bible says about Paul in the book of Acts? It says he changed the world upside down in his time. He's a man that went out and preached to the entire known world of his day. And he turned the entire world upside down because so many people accepted this gospel that God revealed, that Jesus revealed to Paul. And yet today, most Christians, quotation marks there, most so-called Christians don't even follow Paul or don't even know what his gospel is. I've said it many times before, I'll say it again that uh, I've been to about 200 different churches, and every time I go to a church, I like to say, well, first off, I'd like to ask, who here can tell me what the gospel is in the Bible? And in about 200 different churches, only about 10 times have I ever got the right answer. Why is that? Because so many today have turned against Paul, or else just ignore him, that they don't even know where in the Bible it says, this is the gospel. That's so sad. That's so sad. Well, there's so many different things I could say. There's three times when Paul tells us to follow him. In 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 16, he says, Be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, it says, If you're a follower of Paul, then you're a follower of Christ. So the only way to follow Jesus today is go through the gospel that Jesus gave to Paul. Again, Philippians 3, 17, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. So be a follower of Paul. So Paul is so important. Why? Because God gave to him the gospel. I just got a few more verses. And this is why it's so important. I just I wish people would read the Bible. Early Christians, like I said, were called Paulicians. Why? Because they understood the Bible. They read the whole thing. They saw, oh, so the Jews rejected their Messiah, so God called Paul to give the gospel to us Gentiles. And so they said, we're following Jesus through the writings of Paul. 
We're following Christ through the gospel that Jesus revealed to Paul. We're coming to Jesus the way Jesus said for us Gentiles to come, through the preaching of the gospel that God gave to Paul. 1 Corinthians 9.17 Paul says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. A dispensation of the gospel. God gave, gave him something. God dispensed to him the gospel. And then he says, Now I have to go dispense or give to others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. That's why it's so important. I just hope people understand this teaching. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Like I said, I've got several more verses, but unless you understand this, you can't even be saved. Because we're all going to be judged. I forgot to write it up here. According to Romans 2.16, we're all going to be judged according to the gospel that God revealed unto Paul. And if you didn't come through that gospel, then you're lost. And you're still on your way to hell. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3 and verse 2. If you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. God gave to Paul the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul said, it's given to me to dispense to you, word. God gave me the gospel of salvation to give to you. Now, you want to be saved, take from Paul's writings. Take the gospel that God gave to Paul, apply it to your heart. Trust that gospel for salvation. No, no, Paul was a liar and a deceiver and he weaseled his way into the Bible, some say. Well, I have bad news for you. You're going to hell because you choose to reject the Apostle Paul. By rejecting Paul, you want to come to Jesus some other way. When Jesus is the one that says, no, the only way is through that gospel that I revealed unto the Apostle Paul for you Gentiles. <sighs> I hope I'm making this plain enough to where you can understand what I'm saying. It's just frustrating to see the entire so-called Christian world today. They read the Bible, and as they, as they try to preach, they kick Paul out. I've had a guy tell me one time, he says, you're too Pauline. What does that even mean? Paul is our apostle. We're supposed to be following Paul and his writings, because they're for the doctrine for the church age today. How can you be too Pauline? Well, their idea is, well, I will follow Jesus more than Paul. Well, then you're wrong, because Jesus said the only way to come to him and follow him is through Paul. So, how can you... It's like, it's like me, okay? Let's say, let's say I have a guy over here as my bodyguard, and I say, anyone can come to me directly through him. And if you go to him and tell him your name and tell him what you want, he'll bring you to me. But if you come directly to me, I won't accept you. Well, that's kind of like it's set up. Jesus Christ says, look, I came to the Jews. And then he went up into heaven. He tried to save the Jews. They rejected him. So he says, Paul, come here. You stand in front of me, Paul. If anyone wants to come through me, I give you the ticket. And you give them the ticket. But yet people try to go, out of the way, Paul, move. I'm coming to Jesus anyway. And Jesus says, nope, it's all Paul right here. You can't get to me unless you go through him. I don't know why God did it that way. All I know is that he did. And those are powerful verses that you're going to be judged according to the gospel that God revealed and gave unto Paul. You see, one of the things God did when he called Paul was he revealed some mysteries to Paul. If you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, and I preached on those. There's seven mysteries in the Bible. And we looked at those mysteries that God gave to Paul that were only for this time period. And boy, are they doozies. I've got all seven different ones, and you can look them up when you get a chance. That's a fun Bible study, the seven mysteries in the Bible. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Wherefore, Paul is speaking, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. So the mystery, God revealed to him, and then it tells you in verse 27 what the mystery is. Um, Titus chapter 1. Verse 1 through 3. So important to understand why Paul is in the Bible. Paul, want, uh, Paul says in Titus 1, 1 through 3, Paul, an apostle of God, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie have promised before the world begin, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God 
our Savior. Now, did you hear what Paul just said? Paul says, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. Paul says, God committed unto me to preach something in due time. What is the time? It's the time we're in now for the church age to Gentiles. What is he supposed to preach? The gospel. Which is committed unto me, Paul says, the gospel. According to the commandment of God, our Savior. God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, commanded Paul, Here, Paul, here's the gospel to take to the world today for salvation. If they want to get saved, they have to come through what I gave you, Paul. The gospel of salvation. What is the gospel? It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you've seen any of my videos, you've probably seen it. I like to put it on the end of every one of my videos. Because I don't know who, who watches what or when. And I'd hate to know that I preached a message without giving the gospel, and that was the one message that the guy needed to hear it, and it wasn't there. So what is the gospel for today? Well, the gospel that God gave to Paul is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And Paul lays it out as plain and as simple as a man can. I'll read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, our brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third days according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. You see that right there is the most important thing because Peter would preach, oh, this Jesus that died and was risen again, you killed. But it was what was revealed to Paul was, look, this was for us. It wasn't an accident that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again. It was planned out. It was a mystery. It was something that God did to pay for our sins. And so God revealed that unto Paul, the death, burial, and resurrection for our sins according to the Scriptures. And when he told the early church that, that, the early church says, well, we were just preaching who he was. We were all going around telling everybody, trust your Messiah, trust your Messiah, trust your Messiah. And Paul says, well, that's great, but that's for Jews. The Jews need to trust that that's their Messiah. But God told me, Paul says, that you trust what he did for you for salvation. And the Bible teaches when you trust the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection for our sins, according to the scriptures, when you trust that shed blood, that blood atonement, if you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, look up past sermons, look up the one on blood atonement. That's the way to be saved. So there's the message today, Jesus versus Paul. We see clearly in the Bible why Jesus is there. He is God manifest in the flesh. He's the Messiah. But he, a Jew, came to the Jews preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and telling them, trust who I am, you must believe that I am He, that I am the Messiah. When the Jews ultimately rejected for the third time their Messiah, God says, okay, now the message is not just who I am. The message is trust what I've done for you. Because it's all about the gospel, it's all what I've done. And God in heaven, Jesus Christ, said, you know what, I'm going to choose this guy named Paul, and tell him this is the gospel. And by the way, Paul, here's a couple of mysteries I'm going to reveal to you. And now, Paul, you're an apostle that I have chosen to go to the Gentiles with the gospel of salvation. This teaching in no way diminishes our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am not exalting Paul above Jesus in any way, shape, or form. But the only way, according to this teaching, to come to the Savior, Jesus, today, is to come through the gospel revealed to Paul. That's what this teaching is saying. I've known people that say, well, I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus. And I say, well, when did you, uh, when did you hear the gospel? Oh, uh, what's the gospel? Are they saved? You know, there's people today that say, I'm a Christian because I'm a follower of Jesus. And they're just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. Back in the 60s, maybe it was the 70s, they had what they called the Jesus Freaks. A bunch of long-headed hippies that run around, oh, we love Jesus, we're just following his teachings. Oh, yeah, what teachings are you following? Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are they saved? No, but yet they claim to follow Jesus. What they miss? They miss the gospel of Paul. You see, you can't truly be a follower of Jesus and come to Jesus and be saved unless you realize 
It's Paul that has the gospel that saves us and brings us to Jesus. So why is Paul in the Bible? To show us the way of salvation. The way of, of the gospel of salvation. The way to Jesus Christ. Because that's the way God planned it. I, I could go on, but I've shown you the verses. Go back and read the verses. They're so clear. They're so plain. Paul says, God revealed unto me the gospel. Paul says, God committed unto me this to give to you. Paul says, I'm the minister. God made me a minister. He gave me this. And I went up to the early church and told them this is what to preach. And they all got together and they said, you're right, Paul. It's all by grace through faith. So if you're preaching anything pre-Acts 15.11, you're not even preaching the gospel of salvation. What a thing to think about. So do you want to be a Christian? <laughs> Come to the Gospel of Paul. You know, we're not exalting Paul above Jesus. We're just putting him in his proper perspective and why he's there. Paul wrote a fifth of the entire Bible. Paul wrote 51% of the New Testament. And now you know why he's in the Bible. Because you can't get saved without the Gospel that God gave to him. And Romans 2.16 says you will be judged someday according to that gospel. What have you done to, with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What have you done with Paul and his writings and his teachings and his revelations and his mysteries that God gave to him? Want to get to heaven? It's through the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. I hope this clears things up. I hope this helps you to read and understand the Bible. I hope more than anything you get saved through this teaching. This isn't a teaching of a denomination or this group over here. or This, this is just the Bible. And what's, what's odd is many denominations don't have this teaching. It's because they teach their own traditions. And when they're faced with the Bible, they choose to reject the Bible. I hope you'll choose to accept the teachings of the Word of God. Because the Bible says traditions of men make the Word of God of none effect. And that's why we're in the last days. That's why we're in the age of apostasy. is because so many have turned away from the Bible teaching and have chosen to follow denominational teachings rather than the Bible. I hope you'll follow the Bible. hope you'll get saved. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you are saved, read the Bible. Go through it. Understand it. Some people will accuse you of saying, well, you take Paul and you throw the rest of the Bible out, which is what they do, the opposite of. <laughs> they throw out Paul and keep the rest of the Bible. I don't throw out any of the Bible. I instruct you to read the entire thing. But when you do, rightly divide understand the only thing that literally is our doctrinal books of today are Romans through Philemon. Everything else the Bible says are for our example and for our admonition and for our learning. But we're not saved by getting back under the ministry of Jesus. We're not saved by getting back under the law of Moses. We're not saved by, by trying to get back over in some other time period or another dispensation. If we're alive today before the rapture, we're only saved through the gospel. Trusting, believing in the gospel of Paul. I close with Ephesians 1.13. It says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And it says, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation comes through the believing and the trusting of the gospel. But you must first hear it. You've heard the gospel preached today. If you get saved, please send me an email. Let me know. I get excited when people email and say, Man, I got saved. Man, that means you're going to heaven. That means when you stand before God and you're judged according to the gospel, you can say, yeah, man, that's the gospel I got saved on. And God will let you into heaven. So thank you for watching. God bless. Sorry I went a little long, but this is such an important message. And I hope it's a blessing to you. God bless. We'll see you next time on thecloudchurch.org.